Welcome to Witty Talks Diversity and Inclusion. We recently talked with Susie Greenberg, Vice President of Product Assurance and Security at Intel about her role, her career journey, and her perspectives on diversity and inclusion initiatives at Intel. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Can you tell us about your role at Intel? I'm in what's called our product assurance and security group here. And I lead the team that's executing our global security communication strategy and the way we engage and track and respond to matters involving security. So, um, you know, we have a tremendous opportunity at Intel to really lead and role model how everyone should be looking at security and the way that you approach that and engage. And, um, you know, whether it be assurance practices um, to where we're working on being best in class or the products and technologies that we're delivering, it, it's really about supporting that ecosystem change and the approach that everyone takes when they're looking at security. How are you involved in Intel's employee resource groups and leadership councils? At Intel, we have what we call employee research resource groups or ERGs. And within that, there's also seven leadership councils. So I am the co-chair uh, with another colleague uh, supporting the Intel Latinx Leadership Council. And the, the goal of these resource groups is really to encourage employees to participate, to build relationships with a wider community and, and be able to, uh, to exchange learnings, have fun together, um, and, and really support one another as we're kind of through going through our career journeys. Um, you know, I, I was aware and, and, and somewhat evolved when I joined Intel 14 years ago. Um, I was asked to, to join um, and become co-chair uh, during uh, the pandemic. And, you know, it was, it was a difficult time for all of us. I appreciate that. Um, but there was, a, you know, a feeling of isolation. Um, you don't have that social element. We are still trying to figure out uh, how we engaged with each other and how we made those personal connections and this new you know, very isolating way. And um, I was homeschooling three children, no family nearby. So this, this resource group for me personally, um, just it, it was an open door for me to, to step up and play a bigger role in the group. And it was truly a godsend in terms of me being able to find some sense of purpose and to help me build those connections and, and feel like I belonged in a part of this community, especially during those, those few first months of the pandemic when things were incredibly trying. Can you tell us a bit about your family background? Sure. So my um, my grandfather was born in Mexico and um, moved to the United States in the Los Angeles area when he was uh, younger. I met my grandma and um, had two sons, one of which was my dad. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's that's my background um, from a Hispanic perspective. Um, you know, my dad uh, was an incredible role model for me. He was the uh, first Hispanic federal judge ever nominated, one of the youngest, you know, it just what he was able to, you know, my, my grandfather was self-made um, and, and really just built himself up and, and had a successful career in, in property investments and, um, and really an emphasis on, on education because my grandfather didn't have that. Um, and so, you know, between uh, education having a huge emphasis and importance uh, in, in, in my family, um, you know, just the emphasis on family as well has always been um, the things that I always make sure that I'm prioritizing because that was the example that I had growing up. What did the ERGs and leadership councils do to help employees during the pandemic? We did a couple things. One um, was early on, you know, appreciating the fact that uh, folks were feeling fatigued from being online all day and having to be on the phone and, and, and engaged and present. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we really tried to do was have more personal connections with folks and, and not make it so um, intense in terms of adding to their social calendars by, um, you know, a, an additional Zoom meeting at the end of the day, which was intended to be a social gathering, but really just kind of put more on individuals to feel like they, they had to come and, and, and do all the things and be present um, in a way that, that they just weren't capable of in that time. So it was really giving space for folks to be able to talk about where they were, uh, the challenges that they were facing, um, I had a lot of conversations with women who were struggling with homeschooling. Um, you know, I could relate. I have three young kids, one of who was in preschool at, 
at the time. Um, you know, we'd give him a coloring book and hope that he'd make it through a call and five minutes in, he'd be telling me his hand hurted. So, you know, we needed to, we needed to be able to support each other and really kind of just remove all the boundaries and the titles and just strip it down to what was real. And that was that we were all challenged with a number of things during that time. And um, that just fresh perspective and um, that realness, I think was incredibly welcomed during that time. And we were all on a level playing field, right? We were all having this experience together. We were all online. And so it truly did bring people together. And it's one of the things as we kind of start to get towards that endemic that I'm really looking forward to is, is being able to pick and choose those things that I want to uh, really invest in uh, moving forward, whether it be um, the way that I engage with my colleagues or the time that I spend with my family and the way that I'm able to balance or try to balance. I always talk about work-life balance being a myth, but you know, to, to give that you know, very intentional um, perspective to everything that I'm doing and focus um, where I am, but on my time and, and, and on my schedule, right? So it's, um, it's going to be interesting to see what the next year is like for sure. And let's figure out what's going to make us better individuals and, and help us thrive um, personally as, as individuals and as moms and uh, colleagues and friends. I, I, I think that this, if we do it, if everyone can just kind of be intentional, I think that everyone will be able to do it right for themselves. And, and hopefully we'll see everyone feeling a lot better about where they are. Can you tell us your thoughts about the importance of making technology more inclusive? You know, there are there are a number of efforts that we've seen, especially in the last few years, that are really focused on making technology more inclusive. Um, and I, I taught I, I read an article actually a few years ago that really stuck with me in Harvard Business Review that talked about how technology reflects the people who create it, right? Their perspectives, their experience, um, they shape how products are designed, how you see user interfaces when you're looking at your phone. Um, you know, and, and this could be as broad as a smart city or a, a speaker system, right? Um, these are all the things that are becoming more pervasive in our lives. That's why we need to be more secure and be mindful of that. Um, but as an unintended consequence of that, you often see uh, inequality and exclusion as, um, as two things that, that, that tend to come into play as well when you have that perspective and those experiences shaping those technologies. One area that has been um, something I've invested a lot of time and energy, and I started this before the pandemic, um, was uh, with a small team of folks um, to focus on uh, engineering language um, that has truly demoralized many of our friends and our colleagues and our customers. And again, even if it's done so intentionally, um, there are two sets of words that this team, because we were literally only four people when we got together in, in 18, was master slave and whitelist blacklist. And, you know, these were phrases that are, are used in encoding language. They're in textbooks from the 70s. They are, they're very, very pervasive. Um, making these changes and, and having people shift to more inclusive language, like, primary, secondary, or allow and deny, um, you know, that is a, an insignificant lift. You know, it wasn't about putting labels on others or somehow implying that people were racist or that they couldn't understand. It was trying to really kind of change that whole view about the way that um, language really impacts people, that words really matter. And, um, you know, so we've seen a significant shift um, in the last year and a half. And in uh, April of last year, actually, um, Intel and a number of other companies announced a new industry coalition called the Alliance for Global Inclusion. And one of their goals is this inclusive engineering language. And so, um, you know, I, I, we had a, a conversation panel uh, earlier this week with Dell and Micron and a few others. And it's just like, like the work is just beginning, but I just feel like now we have this huge groundswell of support and people are paying attention and everyone is really coming together. And um, the way that we talk about technology and the words that we use and, and really trying to include everyone um, from that perspective. What are your thoughts on sponsors and mentors and how are they different? Sponsor, I like to talk about that as 
um, you know, representation on your behalf, especially when you're not in that proverbial room. Um, a sponsor is going to advocate for you, can represent your work, your value, your potential, even more importantly, right? They, they raise their hand and they say, I think that Susie could go and do that job. You should talk to her. Um, that's sponsorship to me. Um, and I think those are, you know, one to two maybe relationships that you really cultivate and that it's very good. They go very deep um, because this person um, needs to understand you on a level that, um, you know, folks on the day a daily basis aren't going to necessarily see. Um, you know, typically they tend to be a little bit higher up in the company above you. Um, and, you know, they have a, an interest in your success, right? You have confidence that they are going to speak up in that room because they believe in you and because they have the relationships themselves um, to, to advocate in that way. Um, they're harder to find too. Um, you know, I've, I've had times where I've felt um, very, uh, very sponsored and, you know, felt like I was as my cup runneth over in terms of support in that, in that area. And then there are other times, um, you know, one of which was around the pandemic time where I felt very alone and I didn't necessarily know if there was anyone that was speaking up for me in the room. Um, and so, you know, that, those are, those are, those are challenging. Um, you know, I, I do have a few folks now. I don't think we've necessarily formalized that relationship in the sense where I'm like, will you please be my sponsor? But I do have that confidence and I do invest that time with those individuals to make sure that they're aware of what I'm doing and what I am absolutely capable of. Um, mentors, um, I, I tend to look at those a little bit more casually. I think they're a lot more fun because you can kind of pick and choose different mentors for different things that you need, right? I have, um, you know, mentors that can help me understand um, technical challenges. I don't have an engineering degree. So sometimes I need someone to just explain something to me technically that I'm not going to grok and I don't want to necessarily raise my hand in the room and be like, I don't understand what this is, you know? So being able to have someone that you can kind of ping behind the scenes that's not going to judge you and is going to help walk you through that technology, it's incredibly invaluable. I think in general, I will say that regardless of those two different areas, the, the best advice I can give you, the best thing that you can do for these relationships is to be open and honest. Um, you know, be transparent about what your aspirations are. Um, talk about what is important to you because the more you say it out loud, the more you remind yourself, right? Obviously, my family is always going to be the number one most important thing to me. But sometimes when you get caught up in this work and this job, um, you can lose sight of that. So being able to say that out loud and to have people kind of keep you in check. And, and I got a note last night late from someone who we were exchanging messages on a different topic and just said a little something like, hey, you know, hope your family's doing well and you're able to, you know, spend the time and do what you need to, to support them. And um, you know, we weren't even talking about family, but he, he brought that up and uh, I was like, yeah, I will. You're right. I am, I think, but you know, good reminder. And I'm going to continue to do that. So, um, you know, that honesty goes both ways too. So just, you know, kind of my last thought I think is, um, you know, be open to hearing things about you that you might not uh, see or that you might not believe to be true. And I'm not talking about negative things. I'm talking about really good things, right? The things that are really hard for us sometimes to just believe are true. Um, so be open to receiving that feedback. Say thank you. Um, you know, take it in and and use it to energize yourself and kind of take you to that that next place. Um, I think both the mentor and sponsorship roles um, can really uh, value from get a lot of value out of those doing that. What is your approach as a mentor or sponsor? a few things that I, I've done um, is, is offer to have monthly calls with a number of folks on my team who are up and coming, you know, that are just either new to Intel and trying to navigate that space, um, or just I want to help them feel comfortable that they can come to me with their challenges or issues. So I do mentor a lot of people that are within my team itself. The latest that I've done that I, I think is, is hopefully adding some value is, is to be um, be a part of our um, our warm line effort. So when when individuals are, are going through challenges and they reach out um, to folks at Intel, um, you know we can get matched uh, through a series of questions, uh, and I can provide my my help and support 
um, that way as well. So that's something new that I've been doing in the last few months and, and really has given me a lot of perspective on things that we can improve in as a company, as leaders, um, and is also giving me uh, a number of new friends and relationships as well. So um, those are a couple ways that I, I put myself out there. What have been some of your biggest career challenges and how have you responded? You know, I, I, I mentioned it earlier, I, I don't have a degree in engineering. And so, you know, that's always interesting um, when you work at a technology company or you've spent the last 25 years in technology. Um, to this day, it's something that I have to work to overcome, um, which is amazing. But, uh, you know, I've been called the comms girl um, or, you know, reminded I'm not an engineer where it's just like, yep, I'm aware. Um, and, you know, you have to you have to wonder and it's harder when you're younger, or you're just starting out. You know, I've had decades of experience now, so I can reflect a bit and 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 kind of take a step back and say, you know, is is that maybe a, a lack of your own self-confidence there that you need to kind of bring this into play? Um, you know, there's going to always be those individuals who um, will, will put you down to build themselves up. And so I think that's the biggest lesson that I've learned in terms of just trying to turn down the noise around me. And so it's hard. And, you know, so my advice, and it's the same, and I say it like out loud, so I can remind myself here as well, um, is that, you know, you've made it this far because you've excelled in your career. You've been successful at a number of technology companies. Um, and you've proven yourself right time and again. And sometimes it's just, it's worth it just to stop and think about even what you've accomplished in the last three months. I bet everyone could take a moment to just breathe and think about some big milestones that they achieved and, and look back and go, wow, like I did that, you know, and if we just take those times to remember, um, that others believe in us. And, um, even if there are those naysayers, um, they're not the ones that matter. And then, you know, the, the other thing that uh, is, is always challenging for me, especially this last decade, is, is that navigating being a mother and an executive at a company like Intel. Um, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, there's a myth of work-life balance. I, I really try to role model being intentional about the work you do and, and the work that you won't do. Um, you know, what are your conditions of satisfaction and, and how is that going to help you focus on the things that are most important in your life? And, you know, you don't have a family, maybe it's a certain hobby or maybe it's traveling, you know, and we can all go do that again. Um, you know, it doesn't have to just be like, if you're a mother or a father, then you get a certain priority. I think everyone can take this moment to kind of think about where they want to prioritize their time. Um, you know, we should feel empowered to look for opportunities that, allow us to thrive in our careers, and then be with our loved ones when we need to be. Um, it's really, this is something that I, I had to, I had to come to terms with is that, you know, negotiating when it comes to things with my family, not going to happen. Um, if I'm asked to decide what's the most important thing to me, or if I'm going to be at my son's game, or, you know, I'm going to be in a meeting, I, I might have to do both, but, you know, I'm going to do it because I've made that decision for me. And I know that it's not going to negatively impact my children. Um, I want to be a really great role model for them. Um, but I also want to make sure that, um, that I am giving them the time and the attention that they deserve because this period in our lives with them being young um, is going to be gone before I know it and I won't be able to get it back. Um, you know, so that's something I'm especially thinking about as we, we talk about, um, you know, this, this return to the workplace or, you know, coming back to work. Um, it's something that I spend a lot of time thinking about. And it's, it's one of the challenges I, I think I've um, most struggled with is just finding that, um, that unattainable balance between the work and, and, and how I am much I am able to focus on my family. Can you share your thoughts on the importance of giving a voice to disability awareness? One thing I've really seen is just, um, and it, the, and it, more intentional work around, um, disability awareness. Um, and this was, you know, one of the other leadership councils that I was talking about, which is another 
great way that we really try to keep accountability within the company and, and also externally talk about this work that we're doing to invest in our communities. Um, but, you know, I'm also a, a member of the Disability Leadership Council, and it was almost by accident that that happened. Um, it was an accident, actually. I was on a completely different call with uh, someone and I just happened to men oh, he happened to mention some of the work he was doing because he knew I was on the Latinx side. And, um, you know, I said, oh, that's so funny. I've, I've never even thought about, um, you know, joining that group or opting in. Um, I'm deaf in my right ear. And he's like, what? You know, like I had no idea. And it's just like, yeah. And he's like, well, you know, then he wanted to know my whole story and, you know, how I became, I, I became deaf. I, they think it's when I was two years old, I had scarlet fever. Um, I developed my sound, so they didn't think it was from birth, but it's just something I've lived with my whole life. So I never thought to be overly communicative about it. Um, you know, it definitely creates its challenges, especially in like social settings. Um, again, leveling the play playing field, you would never know. I have my earpiece in one ear and why would you, why would it matter? But if I was at a dinner and someone was sitting on the side of me, I would have a really... <laughs> hard time in the evening because especially if it wasn't someone I know I always put my husband on this side because he knows and he can <laughs> you know elbow me but um but you know it's difficult if you're in a social setting you're just meeting someone and they plop down on this side because you just happened that was the last seat you could get I can't hear them and you know then I have to tell them I can't hear in that ear and um so those are the things that I've just always lived with and I I just it's just part of who I am but not to the sense where I I talk a lot about it. And one of the things that this person told me that really just struck home is that um, there are so many other people like you with different disabilities that aren't talking about it. And not just because maybe they've lived with it the whole their lives, so it's just part of who they are and they've accepted it, but because they don't feel like they have the ability or the forum or the voice to do that. And so if I'm willing to go out and talk about my disability and the challenges it presents to me and the opportunities I see for Intel to really kind of help support those folks, well, then that's why it's important for me to talk about, you know, my disability and the journey I've had and the challenges I face. And, you know, that gives permission to others to, to talk more about what they're going through and what they're experiencing. And a lot of these disabilities are, are not someone, you know, in a wheelchair or someone who's blind. Um, these are things that we don't see that may impact a, an employee or someone in their family. Um, and then how do we make that community and that support system um, grow? And so that's something I'm seeing just across the board. That's my example specifically, but I see more of that in a lot of different areas where these communities are coming up really to give a voice to these individuals who didn't feel like they had one before, um, who thought that they might be um, distracting from their work or you know, be viewed negatively because they had something that might impact their ability to do their best every single day. Um, we need to give space for those individuals to be able to talk about what they're going through, um, what their experiences are, what their, um, you know, what their capabilities are, what they can't do and support them. Um, so those are some of the things I see in the next few years really starting to make a difference is just creating that, that forum, that, that opportunity for everyone to bring their best selves to their daily lives and to their work.